Hello and welcome to Journeys in Transformation Analytics. I'm Amr Tripathi. I run uh, at the analytics business in Genpact. And with me today, I have Priyanka Jain, who's joining us again. Uh, she's the CEO of uh, iRing, uh, which is a data science uh, consulting company, and they focus a lot of their efforts uh, in the world of data culture. Priyanka, welcome. Thank you for having me, Amrish. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, I'm looking forward to our second conversation. Perfect. Yeah, no, I know the, the first one where we talked a lot about like, how do you actually even define data culture? It's, it's kind of, it's, it's one of those topics everyone talks about it, but I don't think anyone has a very good definition. So it was really, really fun to do that. Uh, let's, let's, let's take it a little bit forward. Uh, how do you actually create a data driven culture? How do you institutionalize a data culture? Right. Like, that's a great how, question. How, how do you, how do you, like, I'm sure that's, that's why people are interested in the topic. So how do you actually go about thinking about it? Yeah, where do you start? So, so last time, Amrish, when we talked, we talked about four Ds of data culture. And, and the start of your journey is, first step is assessment, assessing where you are in that journey, you know, where your organization is. And typically for our clients, when we go in and we are assessing them, our typical clients have a score of five or less between a, a, for a Likert scale of 10, mm -hmm. 11, zero to 10. They are 50% data they have a data culture quotient of about 50 percent or low or below and, and when and you when you do when you do these data culture assessments is, is it like for the entire organization for a division for like executive how do you think how do, how do you do that it, it is for the entire organization sometimes we work with a part of you know we work with really large organizations so if it's hundred thousand people sometimes we start with a smaller group of 5,000 people who are just in procurement or 5,000 people, 10,000 people just in, you know, customer sales support, right? Or something like that. But, but this whole process that we do is the same one that you'll scale throughout the organization. And there are two parts to how, how we get to that truth. How do we get to data culture quotient measurably? We do that through one is voice of executive. We talk to executives one-on-one -on -one to understand two aspects, what their perceptions of the data culture quotient around the 30 dimensions I talked about last time. And also, uh, their own data-driven leadership, because data-driven leadership, as you remember from our last conversation, is one of the key components of the four Ds of data culture. And then the other thing we do once we took is, is, that, all, is that the is that the most important in your opinion? That's yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Because it all starts from a leadership. I mean, the leaders have to really believe in the power of data. Look at data as a competitive advantage, as an asset, and see what power it holds to automate things for you, to automate decision-making, to empower your, uh, your individual employees with how to build better products, how to uh, optimize their day-to-day -day decision, decisioning, how to bring efficiency, you know, top line, bottom line. So I think uh, it starts from leadership uh, and not every leader in our, every organization is going to, be, going to be at the same level of data literacy, by the way, but it's important that they understand that there is a need for it, that, that it serves them. So if once, once that happens, that typically, so voice of executive then feeds into an enterprise wide data, uh, you know, data culture assessment that we do, which has two components. One is their perception of data culture along these 30 dimensions, or each individual gets to vote and say what their perception is. Again, on a very standardized Likert scale. And then also a data literacy. Uh, every individual needs uh, is assessed at, a, at their, what their level of data literacy is. And it's not a right and a wrong, it's basically, who needs to be at what level and what their current level is. Once we have that, that then matures into our overall story of what the data culture portion for that organization is. And, and sometimes we may find the data literacy score, for example, 10% of the organization is at the right level of data literacy. So that score for them, the data literacy uh, score would be like, you know, one out of a uh, scale right. of 10. So that's how we do start. Now, if you started on that journey, you have, let's say you've done the assessment, where do you go from that? Now, you know, using the heat map where the gaps are. So you need to leverage your strengths and, you know, uh, and figure out a way to sort of uh, fill those gaps. But, and, but, but, but one question on that, does, yeah. what does everyone need to be data literate? Um, they, they, again, so they need to be at some level of data literacy. Um, so for example, the one common persona we find when we go into organization is data skeptic. Now this is one of the most dangerous persona for okay. any organization. And you and I have probably been in meetings yes. where there's one data skeptic who can derail the entire conversation. We've all got together to make a decision on how we're going to do, what we're going to do with this product rollout. And they are uh, often the one who are going to boo-boo all over your data and facts you're going to present. And they not only are they going to do that, they're going to also influence the rest of the people who will say, who'll start doubting the data you're showing them, the facts you're showing them, the whatever. 
right? So this persona, if not at least turned into a data enthusiast, is going to be very poisonous to the rest of the organization. So that's something you need to think about. Um, but but again, you know, your your person who takes up a phone call, customer say a customer support call, they don't need to be a data scientist. Maybe they just need to be data data you know enthusiast. Mm -hmm. So there is different personas that that you are developing your organization to. And right. so yes, the answer short answer is. If you have anything to do with this world, you're, you're living on this world, this business world, the, the language of business is data. And so if you're not speaking that language, how long will you survive? But what you're just saying is, yes, everyone needs to be data literate, but that doesn't mean the same thing for every role that you're playing. And there's a, there's a dimension that you, that you have. Stratified. To... It's stratified. Yeah. Different people need different level of data literacy. And that's a really good point that because most people are not understanding that. Mm -hmm. And they're doing this one size fit all approach, which is sort of is, 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 a, is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, I have to tell you one thing, uh, Priyanka. There, there was a there was a client of mine like a few years ago who actually, I, I, and obviously they were they were not calling it data literacy or anything. But one of the things they got fixated on, uh, and actually it worked, was how they run the meetings. Right? It, it was all about uh, they didn't do do any data culture assessment or anything. They said, listen, but we will not, we will not run the meetings in a particular way. All of them has to have this kind of data. Anything else that I will, will not use it. And, and that really helped change at least the dialogue and discussion. So how would you, do you see spaces for this like that? I mean, those who don't want to kind of do a very structured way of going through institutionalizing it. Uh, and from a consulting, as, a, as consultants, obviously we lo love a little bit of a structure and everything going about doing it. But any tips that you can share uh, for executives who want to go on the journey, but might not have a very structured way? You know, um, at the end of the day, de 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 developing a data culture is a change management process. And what you just described yes. by instituting a structure, and by the way, we include that as, mm -hmm. as part of some of the strategies we do mm -hmm. for our clients, by, inst by instituting a set structure and inserting data as part of that, uh, they made that the, made, they made, everybody had to follow. They, they had to now, I'm assuming, they had to basically build a business case. If they ever came in and asked for 100K or $1 million, they had to build a business case, yes. I'm assuming. It's or not only the business case. case. What they did was they said, this is a weekly meeting. The weekly meeting format is these four sections. This will be kind of, this will be database. And yeah. th you will all come in there and this will yeah. be set of discussions. You will yeah. set up what you are trying to make the decision on. Here yeah. are the pros and cons. I mean, this is a very well structured, it was a very kind of almost like a decision tree they wanted to run in a meeting. And that is how they did the weekly meetings. And that's wonderful because that's, that's the beginning of the change. That's a, uh, I'm assuming that's going to change the culture of the organization, but that's not enough. So those are definitely, those are the things that you would want to do. Uh, not only that, sometimes I'm recommending when I see kind of the organizations I'm going, I'm, I'm recommending zero based budgeting, like stop budgeting status quo, start budgeting. Finance people love that, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, talk to any CFO is like zero based budgeting. Ooh, <laughs> I love that, right? Uh, you know, CapEx, OpEx, you know, how, how do you balance it? There are all these little things which together tee up into this huge train of thought process change that is change management. So it's not one thing that will change it all. It's, it's these, these things that building blocks, think about, about it as a building block. Right. And we are sort of recommending a structured way only from the perspective of you need to know where you're going, have a layout, a strategy, and also have a before and after. Because if you're going to set up a culture of data, you better know how to measure it. Yes. Right? And yes. so that is the idea of you know, going for the structure. But yes, all of these components that you just like, for example, we shared, is going to is going to help with the building of building of let, let me tell you to talk about the 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 other part of, of the whole culture which is obviously i mean training we talked about like normally people think of it as the training but what have you seen work i mean is it like okay there's a there are two schools of thoughts that i see it's like oh there's a, so much content out there can someone just go and and put it in some context and kind of like let, let people have it or is it like or oh, do i need to kind of do a university partnership to kind of really like curate the content that is relevant for my organization. Where do you stand? Like, like what kind of training and support uh, and materials do people need? Yeah, and Amrish, you, you are familiar with our framework that we use yes. called Badar framework. And, and it's a recipe based approach. So when we are thinking about if I have to teach somebody who's never stepped in a kitchen and teach them how to bake a cake, I have to give them a recipe. We mm -hmm. all do that, right? Like we, right. Every, each one of us have gone into and say, oh, today I'm going to make, and all of us are cooking more these days. We're going to do this. 
right? How are you going to do this? Whatever that this is, fala bake falafel or, or make this uh, special tiramisu cake. How are you going to do that without a recipe? It's mm -hmm. the same way. If you are going to be able to teach, if you're going to want your managers to pick up these skills and actually start using it, there are a few things need to happen. One is give them a recipe that they can follow over and over again until they perfect it. Uh, and, and, and thereby where, you know, you have courses like, I'll, we'll teach you Python, we'll teach you visualization. We'll, those don't work because without a framework, this is, that's, by, that's like saying, oh, we'll tell you how to fry. We'll tell you how, what temperatures, you know, your oil needs to reach to fry. We'll tell you, you know, how do you actually treat lentils? You know, it's, it's not constructing, like really, right. the, I would rather learn, like, tell me how to make 10 bean soup. Tell me how to make, bake a cake. You know, it's basically end, end, so basically uh, put it in the case. context. Yeah, put it in the context of the work they're doing. And by the way, I mean internally, that's exactly what we're doing at this whole framework called Genome, uh, which is a lot around collaborative learning, but yeah. a lot of it is around very self-directed directed towards what's your role and within that role, what's expected and kind of just breaking it into that. So yeah, so we actually- yeah. And then the coursework, like if you, for example, you and I have gone through our, our undergraduate graduate program, we've learned statistics and we've learned Gaussian distribution and all of that. And from this, from there to real world application of analytics, data science, there's a huge gap. Why do you want your, your managers to, you know, to, to you first learn this way, university courses or whatever, and then try to take that jump and fail halfway through, right? Exactly. It just does not make sense. So one thing is make sure that you, that you're giving some framework to them. The second thing I would say is always, always, always make sure that you tie a project to their learning because mm -hmm. unless you make it real for them, and that's why we do whatever certification we are doing, if they're going to go through a training from us, they're going to do a project at the end of it because unless they do that, they can't make it on their own, they, their own, that, that whole framework. They can't make that learning on their own, their own. So that's the second part that they, that needs to happen for sure, for it to be successful, that they at least get some skills that they can sort of take forward. Wonderful, wonderful. Hey, Priyanka, we'll continue this conversation. This is just such a fascinating topic and, and something that's kind of probably, a lot of conversations happen, but it's, it's, it's still fairly vague. So, so thank you so much for coming to the show and sharing some insights and some of the learnings that you have had. Uh, so, and and for, for our audience, hopefully you'll kind of join on the third section where we are Priyanka and I are going to talk a little bit more about what not to do. Thank yes, you so much. Thank you for having me.